What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Uh, maybe you are a non-Catholic, maybe you are an active Catholic many years ago, stepped away from the faith for whatever reason, now you're thinking about the Catholic Church again, uh, but you've got a couple of questions that you need to get cleared up in your mind before moving ahead. Or maybe you have no interest at all in the Catholic faith. And to that, we would ask you, what is stopping you from becoming a Catholic? In any event, here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And uh, you can always send us an email, the address ctc at ewtn.com. This will come in very handy for folks watching us on TV today. We're not live on TV, but you can still participate by shooting us an email, ctc at ewtn.com. All right, uh, uh, Charles Beery is our producer, Matt Kabinsky, our phone screener. Also, Rich Jesse today is handling social media. If you want to ask a question on YouTube or Facebook Live, we're streaming there right now. Just put your question in the comments comments box. Rich will see that. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio. Hopefully we can get it answered on today's program. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Andrews. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, my friend? I'm doing decent. Thank you. Got a great objection that we uh, hear from time to time on this program. I'm sure you've heard it throughout your life. Uh, this came from Kim watching us on TikTok. Kim says, according to Revelation 22, 18 and 19, the Catholic Church does not have the authority to change God's word to change God's Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day. What say you, David? Yeah, thanks. Appreciate the question. So uh, I suppose you, you might know that the book of Revelation was a disputed text in Christian antiquity. There were folks that did not think it should be in the Bible. Martin Luther Protestant theologian who founded the Protestant Reformation was someone that had kind of a dim view of the book of Revelation. But it ended up in the Bible. It was placed there by Catholic bishops in the fourth century when the contents of the biblical canon were, were articulated. It was Catholic bishops in synods and councils that did so. It was there on the strength of Catholic tradition. Now, I wonder, do you think the Catholic bishops responsible for placing the book of Revelation in the New Testament, were aware of Revelation 22. I think they were. I think so. Now, now, the guys that put the book in the Bible were also aware of the apostolic tradition, that, that is to say, a tradition coming from the apostles, of celebrating the Lord's resurrection on Sunday. On Sunday. Now, a common mistake that many people make is to think that Sunday is just the Sabbath day kicked one day forward in the calendar. Well, we're not going to do the Sabbath on Saturday today. We're going to do it on Sunday. That's actually not correct. And in the time of the apostles, the apostles were Jews, and they did not stop being Jews when mm -hmm. they believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They continued to gather in the synagogues on, on the Sabbath to hear the law of Moses read. In fact, that's where St. Paul did a lot of his preaching. He would go to the synagogues and preach to Jews and Gentile God-fearers. Mm -hmm. But they also had the habit of meeting on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. They're different feasts. They're not the same feast. So the question that, that troubled the early church was not, do we kick the Sabbath forward one day in the calendar? But what happens when Gentiles join the church? Are they required to follow all the laws of Moses? And it was actually a big point of controversy. You can read about it in in uh, Acts chapter 15, for example. Uh -huh. And there was a group that said, yeah, they need to follow all the Jewish laws. That would include the Sabbath commandments, uh, which, by the way, have nothing to do with worship. Sabbath commandment was not, one day a week you shall worship God. It was rather, one day a week you shall rest from your labor. 
But every day of the calendar was a day of worship for Israel. Of course, right? of course. Uh, so that's another way they kind of misconstrued this controversy. And, uh, and the conclusion was, no, Gentiles don't have to follow the law of Moses to be counted members of Israel, members of the covenant. Um, and, uh, and even the fact that Jewish Christians continued to do so didn't stop them from worshiping the Lord, celebrating his resurrection on the day he rose, which was the first day of the week, nor did it require that Gentile converts follow Jewish law. So that's why you can read, especially in the book of Galatians, book of Colossians, the apostle writes, don't let anybody judge you. And he's writing to Gentiles here. Don't let anybody judge you with regard to a new moon or a Sabbath day or any other observance of Jewish law, because these things are a shadow of what is of what has now arrived in Christ, right? So we can think about the Sunday worship as a culmination, a fulfillment of the Sabbath commandment, but not uh-huh. just a kicking it forward one day in the calendar. Now, Catholic Church concurs in that apostolic judgment, but it's actually something from the community of the apostles we find in Scripture, not something the Catholic Church made up after the fact. Very good. And uh, Kim, thank you so much for your question. Ray has this email for us. Please help me explain to my Baptist friend his question regarding the true presence of the Eucharist. He wonders why the church didn't allow people to drink from the cup during the pandemic if it truly is the blood of Jesus. Yes, thank you. Well, in fact, the church has often denied the cup to the laity. In fact, that was the common practice in the church, in the Latin rite of the church, the Western church, for, say, basically the last thousand years or so. And there, there's no indication in sacred scripture, no command in scripture that the laity are to commune in both kinds. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Christ gives the word to the apostles, he institutes the priesthood and says, do this in memory of me. So this is how you are to perform the ritual. But there are actually no rubrics, no discussion in the Bible of exactly how that is to be carried out in the life of the Christian faithful. There's a reference to the right, uh-huh. but no specific rubrics. So you're not disobeying any divine command there, right? Um, and for a very long time in church history, the lady did not commune in the chalice for several reasons. One is that... Uh, the risk of scandal, because it's just a lot easier to spill liquid than to than to drop, you know, solid matter. Yeah. And because of our belief in the doctrine of the real presence and the reverence with which we treat the consecrated elements, uh, added care is needed. Now, there are other reasons, too. We might be able to get to those after the break. Sounds good. So, uh, Ray, thank you so much for your email. We'll also be getting to the phones. We'll be talking with Vivian in Kansas City. We've got a question here that just came in from Aaron on YouTube. Hey, there's a phone line with your name on it at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. It's called a communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. Looks like two lines open right now. 833-288-3986. Now, before the break, uh, we were answering a question here from Ray, who said, please help me explain to my Baptist friend his question regarding the true presence of the Eucharist. He wonders why the church didn't allow people to drink from the cup during the pandemic if it truly is the blood of Jesus. Yeah, thanks. So I began before the break to explain that actually withholding the cup from laity is a very ancient tradition mm-hmm. in the Latin church. At least a thousand years, laity didn't routinely commune from the cup and still don't. I make a habit myself of not communing from the cup on most occasions. Very rarely would I commune from the cup. Uh-huh. And and uh, so part of the reason has to do with the risk of scandal, right? Because it's it's just easier to spill liquid than to drop solid matter. Yep. But the the doctrine on the Eucharist is that all of Christ is contained in each of the species, the consecrated host and in the chalice. So I commune in all of Christ in virtue of my communion in the sacred host. So the the, the second one is not strictly necessary for me to have a fruitful communion. And in fact, this was a point of controversy in the 15th century, there was a group in Bohemia, sometimes called the Utraquists, from the Latin for both kinds, uh, that insisted that the lady should commune in both kinds. And the church said, no, absolutely not necessary. And, and the Protestant reformers also called for communion in both kinds, and the church had already ruled and ruled again, this is not necessary for a valid communion. And so for my own purposes, I remember when I became Catholic, and I'm a church historian, so I was deeply aware of those 16th century squabbles. 
for me, it was kind of a badge of Catholic identity, sort of a mark of pride that I was yeah. like, I get to communion one, God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get to mark my, I get to show the world that I'm Catholic. Of course. By doing the Catholic thing of communing in one kind. Now, here's another question we might consider. Why did Christ institute the Eucharist in two species, in the bread and the wine? Mm -hmm. Is it because he wanted us to have something to drink with our bread? No, 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 that's not the reason. The reason for the double consecration of bread and wine is so, so that the death of Christ can be memorialized in a figure mm -hmm. of body and blood separated. That, that representation is complete, is realized on the altar, regardless of whether or not I commune. So the purpose of having two kinds is not so that I can have something nice to drink. Paul, St. Paul explicitly condemns that attitude in sacred scripture. He says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? This is not about satisfying your, your sort of culinary fashion. Right, right. right. Uh, it's rather that the death of Christ is displayed for us in the elements in the consecration. So even if I don't commune at all, the double consecration has spiritual benefit for me as I witness the separation of Christ's body from blood in the sacrifice of the Mass. Then I participate in the altar by my own communion, which is fully satisfied by communing in one kind. Ray, thanks so much uh, for your email. Uh, and if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. Do you think we'll hear from any Utraquists today? <laughs> Probably. They might not know their Utraquists. Ah, gotcha. All right, let's lead off here with uh, Vivian in Kansas City, listening on the EWTN app. Hey, Vivian, what's on your mind today? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my granddaughter, she's 14, and she asked me, uh, she told me actually that uh, she didn't think it was right that someone could confess that they had murdered someone and the priest couldn't tell anybody about it. And I did my best to explain that still of a professional that I was hoping that you could give me some better words to use, better ideas uh, to help her understand that. Okay, kind of yeah, a, rough, sure. uh, a yeah. rough phone connection Sure, sure. Let me restate it. So the Please. granddaughter wants to know, why is it the case that priests are bound by the seal in the confessional so that they can't let it be known, say, maybe to the public authorities, if someone confesses not just a sin but a crime, like mm -hmm. something like murder or theft or mm -hmm. something, why can't the priest go call the cops, tell them to pick this guy up? So uh, we got a category mistake here. We have a category mistake. It, it, there is civil justice. There is such a thing as justice in the civil order, in the public forum mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of human life together, and the priest has an obligation to the public forum, right? He does, in fact, have an obligation to the community of, of civil society and of the church. And in, outside of the confessional, if the priest became aware of something that would wound the body politic or the body of the Christian faithful, he would, he would seek that civil justice. He might let the authorities know, maybe he'd file a lawsuit, whatever, whatever the case may be. There is such a thing as civil justice. Outside the confessional. Outside the confessional, okay. right. But the confessional is particularly concerned with the relationship of the penitent to God and to the life of grace. And thus it is the internal forum of a man's conscience before God that is at stake, right? That is that is the specific purview of the confessional, the internal forum, the forum of conscience, rather than the external forum. Now, hopefully, hopefully, if a person is a criminal, right, and they get their relationship with God right, they will change their behavior towards the external forum, mm -hmm. towards the civil forum, mm -hmm. towards uh, the, the, the realm of public justice. Perhaps they will make reparation. They'll do something else to rectify, make satisfaction for the wrongs that they've done. But the job of the confessional is different from that of the police station or, or the juridical court. Now, as a, just a very practical matter, I think many people would resist going to confession if they thought, well, what I say has, is not secure, mm -hmm. and, and the priest could run out and yak to anybody about anything, that, that, would, that would intimidate them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want to go to confession. You know, even, even therapists and psychologists in mm -hmm. our culture are bound by a you know, kind of patient 
a doctor privilege that prevents the psychiatrist or the psychologist or the therapist from revealing anything that the patient says, with one exception. Of course, the therapist is supposed to report if they found out that someone intends to do something wrong, yeah. right? But in terms of what's in the past, they don't report that. Mm -hmm. They don't report that uh, because they want people to get help. And if you didn't think that your that your confidence was respected, you would you would be loath to go get help. So, what situation would you like? Like, let's let's compare two alternatives. All right, let's have one regime where criminals are seeking God's grace to reform their lives, encouraged to do so because of the mercy of God's tribunal in the confessional, and a regime where they're not seeking to reform their lives mm. and they're not seeking God's grace because they're not encouraged by the expression of God's mercy in the confessional. Which one is better overall for the public good? Well, when you put it that way. A regime in which people are <laughs> seeking to amend their lives sure, and change. Sure, sure. Definitely. All right, Vivian, thank you so much for your call. Don't know if you've ever seen that terrific uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie on this very topic called I Confess. Montgomery Clift, as I recall, played the part of the priest in uh, Canada. Fascinating movie. No, haven't seen that one, although... Uh, you know, the Marvel superhero movies have a series about the Daredevil, mm. and it opens with Daredevil going into the confessional, seeking absolution. You can't actually do this. He <laughs> says, I want absolution for something I'm about to do. Ooh. And the priest says, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work <laughs> that way. But then what ensues is a series-long dialogue between Matt Murdock and the priest, who emerges as a very positive and sympathetic figure. It was interesting for Hollywood to come out and give this positive yeah. portrayal of a priest mm. and, a, and the confessional, in which, of course, he corrects the fellow's misunderstanding of what the confessional is for. Anyway, that opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-3986. Call to communion here on EWTN. Let's go now to Gabrielle in Brooklyn, listening on her Alexa device. Hey, Gabrielle, what's on your mind today? Um, I have, uh, in my church, there is no crying room. And there are people who bring their small babies, young babies and small children to Mass, and they make a lot of noise. And it's very distracting. And I think it's very inconsiderate. And sometimes I find myself having to push down anger while I'm trying to attend to what's going on. And I wanted to know if it would be appropriate for me to maybe say something to father or pastor, maybe someone could talk to these people and say, this might not be the best idea to bring small babies and children to work. I mean, to mass. I don't, I don't know if that's appropriate or if I sound like a mean old lady or what, you know, I don't know what to do about it. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. So here's, here is the rock and the hard place that we're stuck between, okay? <laughs> and we are stuck between a rock and a hard place here. If, if the priest starts making a big deal out of the noise that children make in Mass, and there is no cry room, so the architecture of the church does not permit an alternative, mm -hmm. here is a very probable result. They will stop coming to Mass. Yeah. They will stop coming to Mass. I've seen it happen. Sure. And, and so, so if we want to have families in our church, if we want to have children in the church, which we clearly do because no children today, no priests tomorrow, mm -hmm. no sacraments for old people, yep. right? Yeah. You want to have kids in the, in the Mass. You want them to be saved, too. Um, uh, he's not merely pragmatic. Uh, so what do we do if we're the older, mature people, right? Well, hopefully some of us remember when we had you know, two- and three-year-olds running mm -hmm. around, and how difficult it was for us, right? And and well, how low our expectations had to be for our own involvement in Mass at that time, and how uncomfortable we felt. I mean, I remember when my kids were small. I mean, I felt pretty awful sometimes when they were misbehaving, and everybody, you know, they must think I'm a terrible parent, and I'm up to my eyeballs in this stuff, and I'm tearing my hair out. That's why I don't have any today. You know, I mean, what am I going to do? It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, but I'm trying is. to be a faithful parent. I'm trying to be a faithful husband and a Catholic, and I'm trying to teach my kids reverence for the Mass. It's not easy. It's not easy. Um, so hopefully a little empathy towards them. And, like, I'm sympathetic, so the, being annoyed, man, it's just annoying. Mm. And I've been there many times. This is what Therese of Lisieux calls her little way. Right? We hear about the little way of St. Mm -hmm. Therese of Lisieux, right? Mm -hmm. What's the big way? Well, the big way is, you know, 
going off to the dark of heart, the heart of darkest someplace or another to do some grand deed for God that makes, a, makes for a good novel or a good movie. That's the big way. The little way is putting up with all the minor annoyances that constitute daily living um, that are not the kind of things you're going to write home about. You're not going to make a film about them. But they really are the heart and soul of holiness when I can perfect my own passions uh, in respect to the petty injustices that other people foist upon me constantly. Mm. That really is the work of holiness. So I, I wouldn't think that battling with one's own inner demons in the Mass is a waste of the Mass, as if somehow if I were distracted that made the Mass unfruitful. On the contrary, that might be the occasion for an extraordinarily fruitful Mass— the purpose of which is for me to unite my mind and heart to God in the quest of a perfect life, which means that I have dispassion towards those sorts of things and charity towards sinners and the parents of small children. Gabrielle, thank you so much for your call. It's called a communion here on EWTN, uh, and our phone number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Teresa is listening to us in North Carolina on Sirius XM Channel 130. Teresa, what's on your mind today? Um, hi. Yeah, it's about the previous uh, a couple of questions ago um, about the Sabbath, and I understand what you're saying, that it's two separate things, and that we are not required to observe the law of Moses. But the, the uh, thing about the Sabbath is also a commandment. Uh, and so I wonder, does that commandment go away? Is that abrogated? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So the, the command, as it belongs to the natural law, and see all of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments of Moses correspond to things that are naturally good for us. It rather frustrates the end of human flourishing, for example, if you murder somebody, right? These are things that are natural goods to us. And we have a natural inclination and a good to know the truth about God and to render him the praise and worship that is due his name. So there is, a, there is incumbent upon us as a matter of natural law, mm -hmm. not just the prescription of Mosaic law, that we ought to offer right worship to God. That can't possibly be aggregated. I mean, abrogated. Uh, I mean, it'd be like commanding someone not to seek the, the good of their own intellect, yeah. which is what the knowledge of God is, in fact. Mm -hmm. So that can't be abrogated. But the specific uh, ritual actions associated with the Jewish Sabbath, those those are for a time and, and are not, not imposed as a necessity upon upon uh, Christians, even less, even less the elaborations of that commandment that were witnessed in, say, Pharisaic Judaism of Jesus' day. Jesus himself is constantly finding fault with that, criticizing folks for, you know, you criticize somebody for breaking the Sabbath, but you'll pull your own donkey out of a ditch on the Sabbath. Yeah. The Sabbath was made for man, not made for the Sabbath, not man for the Sabbath. Teresa, thank you so much uh, for your question. Nancy Joe is watching us on Facebook today. Dr. Anders, I got my cradle Catholic Catholic, I'm not quite sure what that means, to listen live with me today. Could you please explain how Constantine did not start the Catholic Church? Constantine did not start the Catholic Church in the same way that I did not start the Catholic Church, <laughs> in the same way that Tom did not start the Catholic Church. Jesus started the Catholic Church. Period. Jesus started the Catholic Church, right? I didn't invent the light bulb, you know, or the Model T Ford either, right? Yeah. I, I wasn't the founder. Constantine didn't invent those things. Other people did. Jesus founded the Catholic Church. What did Constantine do? He said, bishops, can you guys please settle your differences over the doctrine of Christ's divinity? So mm. Constantine was, was integral in, in motivating the church to convene the, the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, where bishops in an ecumenical council defined the content of the dogma of the Trinity. It wasn't Constantine who did that. Right. It was bishops. Now, the church, when it became, after the Edict of Milan, became legal in the Roman Empire, uh, <clears throat> obviously was embedded in the, the culture of imperial Rome. Well, just like the Catholic Church in America is influenced by American culture, so the 4th century Catholic Church was influenced by Roman imperial culture, but to be influenced by something is not to be founded by it. True that. Nancy Joe, thanks so much uh, for your call. Lots more straight ahead here on this edition of Call to Communion. Stay with us.
Hey, what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Let's talk about that here on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. One line open right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Let's go to Dave now in Cincinnati listening on the great Sacred Heart Radio. Hey, Dave, what's on your mind today, sir? Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. How lucky a bunch of wounded humans are we to have a God as just as we do. Yes, indeed. True that. (laughs) When you said that uh, before the break, Tom, true that? Uh Uh-huh. Great slang to uh, cement what Dave just said. Anyway, my question is, we just learned that Jesus breathed on on them after their resurrection. Mm -hmm. But they had to wait for Pentecost. So is there any difference between... Jesus' breath and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I can answer the question. I appreciate it. So, you know, biblical, different biblical authors have different priorities in the way they structure the material, the biographical material about Christ and the apostles. It's not, it's not an exaggeration to say they have different theologies, complementary theologies, not contradictory theologies, but they, they select and shape their material because they're trying to make a specific point. Um, in, in John chapter 20, where we read about Christ giving the Holy Spirit to the apostles, it's interesting. The same chapter also immediately follows with the discussion of Thomas, who was not a witness to the Lord's resurrection, did not at first believe, and says, you know, unless I can see him and put my hands and the wounds in his side, I won't believe. Then, of course, Christ appears to Thomas and said, well, you've seen and now you've believed. Blessed are those who don't see yes. and yet nevertheless believe. Well, it's interesting and I think compelling that that description follows on a discussion of the sacrament of reconciliation. Because, see, that's our position every time we go to the sacrament of reconciliation. We are those who do not see and yet have faith that Christ is present in the sacrament as he said he would be. Mm-hmm. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven, right? That's the point of the representation in St. John's Gospel. St. Luke has a different set of priorities. His, his, his Gospel and the book of Acts really are about the growth of the church and that the Spirit accompanies the church in its public witness. That's a different manifestation of the Spirit for a different purpose. Uh, and every time the Spirit is spoken of in the Luke-Acts literature, it's usually associated, every time usually, most of the time, it's associated with some form of Spirit-inspired speech. So occasionally people will speak in tongues, sometimes they'll prophesy, sometimes we're just told, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. But the presence of the Spirit in their life is there for the sake of this public witness. Now that's represented to us today in the Sacrament of Confirmation. And it comes through the laying on of hands specifically, and it's not something reserved only for the apostles and their successors, the bishops and the priests, but it's, some, it's the common property of the whole people of God, that we can all participate in that manifestation, that outpouring of the Spirit. And as you go to the Old Testament background for these sacraments, you'll see that the coming of the Spirit is associated with different manifestations depending on the biblical book. So. In Ezekiel and Jeremiah, for example, the coming of the Spirit is associated with the change of heart of one's interior life, right? And that's what's accomplished for us in baptism. Uh, The prophet Joel, which is what the book of Acts cites, uh, we see the the, the Spirit coming with these manifestations of spiritual knowledge and insight and prophecy and visions and dreams and so forth. Um, And then, of course, in uh, in the Johannine uh, uh, literature, it's associated particularly with the forgiveness of sins through the Sacrament of Reconciliation. All right. And uh, Dave, thank you so much for your call. Let's go to uh, Greg right now in St. Paul, Minnesota, listening on YouTube today. Hello, Greg. What's on your mind today? Hi. uh, Thanks for taking my call. Always Mm -hmm. a great program. Um, I have, you know, Easter just ended, and for some reason at Easter, religious subjects come up in conversation and and i'm always so uh you know almost caught like a deer in the headlights because well it's like with a my family i mean uh, almost all of them were raised catholic but now we're dealing with varying degrees of of alienation you know some are you know divorced others are embracing these alternative lifestyles a, a divorced in a way that, where from my point of view, it seems like there'd be no hope of, of an annulment. I mean, it seems so 
uh, outside the bounds of our regular normal Catholic order and discipline and stuff and, and their beliefs. It's almost like in many cases, it's almost as if they've embraced another religion, but then, well, for whatever reason, they waste, waste their breath and sit around and complain about us still in the Catholic Church. So your, your question then, uh, Greg, would be what? How, how do I... Well, uh, it's almost an impossible. What do I do with this? And uh, for example, would I be correct in, in maybe in encouraging the, them to attend a Lutheran church or an Episcopal church? Uh, and would that be wrong? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So we have to kind of tread a narrow path here. I have to be careful how I, how I say this. Um, the church has a principle in its moral theology called the principle of gradualism. What gradualism means is that if I can help somebody take a step in the right direction, well, it's worth taking a step. You know, I mean, the, the virtuous life, the moral life, is the life according to right reason. Well, few of us are perfect by that standard. P yeah. Few of us are, are perfectly rational in our moral activity. Mm -hmm. But we can be more or less rational. You know, I can be, I can be more temperate you know, I've given up that fourth piece of pecan pie, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's better than being completely indulgent. Yeah. You can make progress in the life of the virtue without having the whole thing all at once. And if I can help somebody make incremental steps in, in the reformation of their life, that's, that's a task worth taking. Now, can, can other religious traditions other than the Catholic faith help people on the path to virtue? Well, I think that's obvious. The answer to that is obviously yes, mm -hmm. right? There are benefits that come from from you know the communal attempt to live some kind of ethic that requires you know some sort of self-knowledge and and an attempt to reform my life according to some standard that might be more or less rational mm -hmm. um, does that mean that I would like to positively encourage my my wayward loved ones to go seek out membership at a in a non-catholic denomination probably not I probably would not L lest I be perhaps misunderstood as advocating indifferentism yeah. Right, so it's one thing to say that some other denomination may help someone reform their life. It's another thing to say it's just as good as the Catholic faith. Well, I don't hold that. Don't think it's just as good. Uh, it might be second best, but it's not just as good. So the goal here is primarily how can I help my loved ones and myself grow incrementally in virtue and the grace of God? Now, I think the best way to do this is to exemplify the virtues that I think they lack by not being Catholic. If you think that, ca that Catholicism will advance them in the life of virtue and charity, and that you think they lack those virtues, uh -huh. make sure you don't like those virtues. Yeah. And Jesus told us that our job was to be lights, not to be sledgehammers, to let our good works shine before men so that they might glorify God. Now, that, that doesn't mean doing my good works to be seen by men. I mean, there's the obnoxious guy that says, hey, look at all these good works I'm doing, yeah. right? Uh, but the one who, through a quiet, humble obedience to, to, to divine charity, genuinely is a witness to the goodness and the love and the patience and the kindness and the mercy of God, and, and is himself patient and leaves the judgment of souls and the salvation of souls up to God's timing so that I'm not in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to follow Jesus. I'm not in a hurry for everybody else to conform their life to mm -hmm. my expectations, mm -hmm. trusting that if I am faithful to my vocation, that can only do good to those around me. Greg, thanks so much for your call. We hope that's helpful for you. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Got a question from Katie May watching us on YouTube today. Dr. Anders, could you please talk about the book Jesus Calling. I have two Catholics praising the book. However, I have read reviews that we Catholics should not read it. Are you familiar with this book? I am familiar with the book. I would advise against it. I would advise against it. So I, I have several difficulties with the text. One of them is that the author Sarah Young claimed in an earlier version of the text uh, that, uh, that she received this well, if not exactly by revelation, it was sort of hinting in that direction, right? And, uh, and claimed for it kind of a quasi-divine authority. That's problematic to begin with. Now, she later revised that claim and, mm -hmm. and backed away from it, so just her own private theological opinion. But the text is still written 
in, in the form of a second person address from Christ to her, right? To, so one, one reads it as words of Jesus coming towards one. And uh, uh, that genre of literature is not in itself problematic. I mean, you find the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis is written in that genre. Um, the, say the Diary of St. Faustina contains those kinds of representations as well. Um, uh, but what is problematic is that people will pick up a text like that and they'll read it and go, well, you know, here's Jesus saying this, right? Yeah. And if, they don't, if they don't recognize that this is just a genre, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and then more problematic still is that the content of those purported, well, either quasi-revelations or spiritual insights, however you may take them, really are based, grounded in evangelical Presbyterianism, I see. right? And so Sarah Young is the, uh, is the, I think, the wife of a PCA pastor, Presbyterian Church of America. Mm -hmm. And it really reflects kind of the evangelical wing of uh, modern evangelical Presbyterianism. So the, the, the theological content is problematic from a Catholic point of view. So mm -hmm. for all those reasons, I would, I would steer away from such books like that. If, if you want to read texts that are written in that in that kind of second person narrative style mm -hmm. how about the diary of saint faustina yeah. or how about the imitation of christ or any of the great catholic spiritual literature that's out there there you go katie may thank you so much for checking us out on youtube it is called a communion with dr david anders here on EWTN, Tom Price reminding you to join us for Women of Grace with our own John Ed Williams. You can hear it Monday through Friday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern. We also have an overnight encore if you're up really early, uh, 3 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, 12 midnight Pacific on EWTN Radio. John Ed shows you how to embrace the Catholic life with joy and peace. It is a terrific show. Don't have to be a woman to uh, enjoy Women of Grace right here on EWTN. Let's go now to uh, Matthew in Queens, New York, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Matthew, what's on your mind today? Hey, guys. How are you? Howdy. Um, so I was listening before, and there was a caller speaking about young parents going to church with loud kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm a young father, even though I'm turning 40. Uh, I'm a young father. <laughs> young guy. Of, uh, young guy. Of a uh, 15-month-old, and, and my wife just had a baby uh, a couple weeks ago. Ah. So um, we started bringing our little daughter to church right after she got baptized around three months, and uh, she does make noise. Now, thankfully, we haven't, you know, received any scoffs or any um, eye rolls. Uh, but if we do... How how would we actually respond to that? What what what's the what's the flip side of the argument uh, from our perspective? Uh, any advice that you can give? Mm. Because you know we feel embarrassed sometimes if the baby's going a little crazy, and we also get a little like, oh man, we got to do this again. But uh, we feel it's our Catholic duty to do it. So yeah, any advice sure. you can give for yeah, us. Yeah, sure. So but, first of all, Matthew, thank you so much for taking your children to Mass. Yes. Thank you for doing that. That's heroic. I mean, it really is heroic. And it can be quite challenging. As a father of five, I can tell you it can be quite challenging. So uh, first of all, just good that you're there. I mean, there's no bad way to do it. Um, secondly, you're not obligated, of course, to sit there for the entirety of the Mass. And sometimes the little the little kids get so active, you just have to kind of get up and walk out, you know, into the vestibule and kind of, you know, take a lap mm -hmm. and see what you can do. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's fine. That's okay. And so you have to strike a prudent balance between trying to keep my kids in mass and teach them the habit of reverence versus, you know, the curmudgeonly old folks around you who are getting irritated. You know, you kind of strike a balance. And that's really a matter of a judgment call for you about how you can do that. Um and, uh, but by all means, keep bringing them. And, yeah. and don't be ashamed and don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed. I mean, you're, you're doing the right thing by being there. I can remember a time when uh, a priest friend of ours actually stopped the Mass in the middle of his homily because there was a mom, no dad nearby, with several kids, and this one child was really making the noise. And he said, Mom, I'm going to stop right here. Go ahead, take that infant out. And uh, you and you, pointing out to two other mothers, you two get on the ends of the pews and, and keep an eye on the other ones, and it'll be fine. You just work it out. And then he continued with this homily. Hmm. I thought that was pretty cool. Interesting. Yeah. All right, let's go now to uh, Jackson in Atlanta, listening on iHeartRadio today. Hey, Jackson, what's on your mind today? 
Hi, uh, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. So my question is, if we all came from Adam and Eve, so why do the Jews were the only sons of God and, and the Gentile were not until Jesus died on the cross? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. I, I think it misconstrues the biblical data, however, and clearly it is not the Catholic position. So it's not true that that no one had a saving relationship with God outside of Israel until Christ. That's that's not true. And in fact, there's a rather lengthy prehistory before Abraham, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which include many instances of men and women of God who walked with God in extraordinary ways, who were not themselves Hebrews. Now, the calling of Abraham, the beginning of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, was not for the sake of Abraham alone, it wasn't for the sake of the Hebrews alone, or Israelites alone, or the Jews alone, it was for the sake of the whole world. And when God called Abraham, the promise was that through his seed, all nations of the world would be blessed. And that includes nations that were contemporaneous with Abraham. So read, for example, the book of Job is not written about an Israelite. It's written about somebody outside the household of Israel who's nevertheless blessed. And there are other biblical characters that we meet throughout the narratives of the Old Testament. The Ninevites, for example, in the book of Jonah, uh, who are blessed by God, even though they're not uh, uh, members of God's household. Now, yeah. the, the parable of Jonah is particularly instructive because Jonah's indignant about it. He says, that's why I didn't want to go preach to those Ninevites. I know you were a God of mercy. You'd have mercy on those guys. I didn't want you to have mercy on them. And God says, hey, Nineveh's a big city. It's got lots of people and cattle and sheep and goats and goldfish. I'm going to be merciful on them if I want to be, right? So it's not, it's not as if everybody else was fundamentally excluded, but rather that the, the election of Israel was to make God's mercy more manifest in a public way to the entire world, and ultimately to bring forth Christ the Messiah that would reconcile all things to God through himself. Jackson, appreciate your call. Let's go to Jim now, a first-time caller in New York City, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Jim, what's on your mind today? Hi, Dr. Anders, long-time listener here. Um, my question is, um, you know, you, you always advocate, you know, you should be a profession and, you know, you should always be contrite and persevere till the end. But my question is, does, does God kind of like just judge us, like that we persevere to that last end? And, you know, what about the body of work of our lifetime? I guess meaning like if I was in sin for the last 20 or 30 years, but I really am, you know, I really have a conversion of heart and persevered. Is that just okay? I, I, I don't know if I'm yeah, sure. I think I got you. I got you. Thank you. Appreciate the question. So the Catholic doctrine is that we cannot merit anything from God if we are in the state of sin as opposed to the state of grace. All right. So the fundamental change that has to take place in our lives is the, is the transition from the state of sin to the state of grace. Now, once we are in the state of grace, we can merit reward from God. And uh, whether we are in the state of grace or sin, mm -hmm. Scripture is clear that we will be judged on our works. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the epistles teach. That's what the book of Revelation teaches. We will be judged according to our works. Um, and uh, while Christ enumerates some specific things, namely the works of mercy, if we feed the hungry and clothe the naked and uh -huh. so forth, Catholic doctrine is a bit more expansive, that, namely that every good thing that you do in the state of grace can merit eternal salvation. So if you are an artist, for example, you can paint for God's glory and merit salvation. If you are an architect or a home builder, you can build for God's glory and merit yeah. salvation. If you are in uh, the vocation of married life, you can love your wife and children or your husband and children and do good by them and thereby merit eternal life. And all these things can be judged by God. Judgment does not necessarily imply condemnation. It can also imply well done, good and faithful servant. The, judge, the, the judgment that God renders can be at a boy. Yeah. Jim, thanks so much for your call. Let's go to uh, Darrell now in Houston, listening on YouTube. Hey, Darrell, what's on your mind today? How are you doing, guys? Uh, appreciate the show. Um, question is, uh, I've noticed uh, this type of phraseology or this, this, this term from Protestants a lot, like televangelists or even uh, in different services, they say, today I have a word for you, The whole, or, or the Holy Spirit told me, or I really have something for you that's going to change your life. And they use this, I have a word for you, or God told me last night, or something 
a, 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 a long, along that range of, of, of talk of, of terms where they, uh-huh. where they they always have a word for you, where, where the Holy Spirit impacted them to give us a teaching for today. Uh, is, is this is, is, is this problematic? Is this consistent with with uh, uh, with the church? Thank you. I appreciate the question. I think it's extraordinarily problematic. I think it's extraordinarily problematic because this person is essentially claiming to mm. have prophetic insight, and those claims are almost never warranted, almost never warranted. Generally, in my experience, uh, what, they, what they actually indicate is that this person has a strong subjective conviction, and they have ascribed to that conviction uh, the force of divine authority. Now, that's really, really, really dangerous. And they don't think of it, they don't realize the danger that they're putting themselves and other people in, right? Because they've been conditioned by their religious culture to interpret their strong convictions and their emotional experiences as the activity of the Holy Spirit when they are nothing of the sort. Mm -hmm. And I think the history bears this out pretty clearly. Um, For example, around the the last election, there were any number of self-proclaimed Pentecostal prophets that went out on the road and announced that God had declared the outcome of the election and it was a foregone thing and they were all wrong, right? <laughs> they were all wrong. Yeah. They were just they were just giving out their own opinions about what they hoped would happen. They were trying to influence behavior sure. and ascribing uh, divine authority to it. And uh, I have seen this kind of behavior do incalculable harm in people's lives, particularly the more specific they become when people start to indicate to others, this is what you ought to do. Now, what does the Catholic Church teach about decision-making? Are we to make our moral decisions or our vocational decisions based on somebody else's subjective uh, opinions or feelings or affections that they ascribe to the Holy Spirit? By no means. Instead, we are to seek to manifest the virtue of prudence, and prudence means seeking wise counsel from older, experienced people, considering circumstances, familiarizing ourselves with relevant similar cases, uh, drawing inferences from the way things generally are, uh-huh. these kinds of things. And then, of course, a, a rational reflection about what the actual good in the situation is, and then following the dictates of conscience, which is a rationally informed uh, moral choice, not not in the subjective whims of of so-called prophets. So yeah. if somebody says, I have a word for you, I have a word for you too, anti-disestablishmentarianism. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yep. All right, uh, Darrell, thanks so much for your call today. Uh, ben is watching us on YouTube. Could you please give guidance to how to pray the Liturgy of the Hours if you work third shift as a truck driver, as I do, and you just can't pray those prayers? What say you? Yeah, well, you don't have to pray all the prayers. I mean, like, so you do what you can. Do what you can. You do what you can. Now, there are some abbreviations of the breviary. That mm. sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? It does. Um, uh, there's, a, a, I think, a little tiny abbreviation of the breviary. It might just be called Daily Christian Prayer. You know what I'm talking about, Tom? I do. Right? Where you can you can pray, uh, you know, the ordinary of the, uh, of the liturgy and, mm-hmm. you know, maybe some of the psalms, but not the whole thing. So you do what you can. Now, this is actually the origin of the rosary, because in the Middle Ages, the Benedictine monks would pay, pray all 150 psalms every week, and the lay people just could not keep up. You know, they mm-hmm. had fields to till and cows to milk, and many of them were illiterate. And so they had the habit of praying the 150 Ave Marias as a sort of accompaniment to, to the Psalter when they could yeah. do the whole Psalter. So any form of prayer is good, right? So you, the important thing is to pray. Do those portions that you can. I know uh, when my own family has, we've sort of fallen in and out of the habit of praying the, the, the daily office. Uh-huh. Uh, sometimes we'll just pray, um, you know, the Nunc Dimittis at night, um, which is just, you know, the one prayer from, from night prayer. Or we mm-hmm. may pray, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Magnificat or... Uh, uh, just take one, 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 maybe a single antiphon even mm-hmm. can be edifying. Well, you know, technology is not always our friend. Sometimes it is our friend, and there's a number of apps out there that have the Liturgy of the Hours. That's true. That's not true. only in print, but also in audio form where you can, you know, I don't recommend closing your eyes while you're driving that truck, but you can you know, just listen to the prayers being spoken through your, you know, your your there you go. truck speaker. That works, too. I think that's a, that, that's a great idea. We just have uh, just a couple of seconds here, so not enough time to go to another call. Let me ask you about uh, the wonderful website, Call to Communion. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate the, the question. So calltocommunion.com actually preceded 
this radio show. It was sort of the inspiration in part for this show. It was mm-hmm. a website dedicated to dialogue between Catholics and non-Catholics, specifically Reformed Presbyterian Protestants. And most of the contributors are themselves converts to the Catholic faith from those traditions. And it's got a lot of great content, uh, some of it highbrow, some of it middlebrow, um, about the difference between Protestants and Catholics and what led us to the Catholic faith. And you've contributed a number of articles. Uh, uh, quite a few, quite a few over the, over the years, yes. All right, do check that out, call to communion.com. Dr. David Anders, a fast-moving hour. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Tom. Remember that we do this program Monday through Friday on EWTN on the radio side at 2 p.m. Eastern for our live broadcast, 11 p.m. Eastern for the Encore. You can certainly check out the podcast anytime you wish by going to EWTNradio.net, EWTNradio.net. On behalf of our fantastic team here, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Thanks for joining us. See you next time here on EWTN's Call to Communion. God bless. God bless.